we are live good morning everyone to our second talk on the series let's talk primates 2.0 today we have dr goro hanya who would be talking to us about bridging temperate and tropical forests coping with seasonality by japanese and bornean primates to give you a little introduction about uh, dr goro hanya he is an associate professor at the Primate Research Institute, Kyoto University, Japan. He has studied wild Japanese macaques in the highland Yukushima for more than two decades, which has shown a clear contrast in various ecological characters uh, with the lowland groups in the island. He also studied uh, primates in the core part of the Southeast Asia tropics in the primary lowland diptocarp forest of Damun Valley, Sabah Borneo. Combining all these findings, he will discuss difference in the patterns of seasonal fluctuations in food availability in the two extreme habitats and how primates cope with the seasonality to survive there. Over to you, sir. Dr. Goro? Yeah. Yeah, you're okay. on. Okay, may I start? Okay, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. So I'm so delighted to be invited and introduce my study to, to Indian and Indian primatologists and other countries. So my today's my talk is a bridging temperate and tropical forest. So they are my study subjects are Japanese macaques and uh, Bornean primates. So these are obviously the two extremes of the primate habitats and. Uh, and India is interestingly between these two extremes, which is a little bit dif also different from both from latitude and latitude and longitude. So, I'm so interested how the the uh, the Indian primatologists think about my ideas, which have derived from these studies. Okay, if you Google search the word season, so the 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 images. Is like this. So obviously, the for English-speaking people, the season is divided into four, and it is almost the same for in Japanese word kisetsu. So anyway, again, the seasons are divided into four: spring, summer, autumn, and four, uh, winter. Same as the French word saison. But uh, if you search the Malaysian or Indonesian language musim. It is a little bit different. So obviously, so Indonesians or Malaysians, so the season is a kind of exotic. So these are of course not their own country. So this is somewhere in Japan or Europe or North America. So for them, the season is a term which is a kind of exotic and does not exist in their own climate. Actually, many of my Malaysian friends very often ask me. What is the season right now in Japan, Goro? So <laughs> I think no, for example, no British, no Portuguese, no Canadians, or no Australians, they never ask such kind of questions. So July is always summer in Northern Hemisphere, and it is winter in the Southern Hemisphere. But those things are not happen, happening in the tropical region like these countries. Okay, non-human primates are distributed in many places in the in, and the northern limit of the distribution is in Japan in Shimokita Peninsula, uh, which is about 42 uh, degree in the north. But anyway, most of the primates are like this. They live in tropical forest. You know, both these are the primates I have seen. These are the wild primates I have ever seen by myself. So uh, unfortunately, I've never been to India, so I don't have pictures of Indian primates. But anyway, these are, of course, these are typical primates, but they are not the only primates, non-human primates. They are, we also have non-human primates like this, living in a snowy habitat and snowy habitat and huddle each other to warm themselves up. They are also, uh, this is also the habitat of the non-human primates. So my study site 
in Japan is Yakushima, it is the southern limit of the distribution of Japanese macaque. So, uh, well, as a standard of this species, this is a southernmost. So, in the in the lowland, it is covered with warm temperate broad-leaved forest, which is warmer than any other uh, habitat of the uh, uh, Japanese macaques. It is co extensively covered by warm temperate broad-leaved forest. But if you go upward, the vegetation changes. It is mixed with the coniferous forest. If you go into the forest, you can find these magnificent uh, cedar trees of which sometimes exceeds thousands of years old. Well, I took this picture when I was a graduate student, but I now this tree has already fallen down. So I witnessed a death of uh, organisms of living, living more than thousands of years. And if you go further higher, so this is the second highest mountain in this island. It's uh, altitude is 1,886 meters. Above this line, below this line is covered with uh, forest, but above this, it is covered with grassland uh, made of bamboo. In winter, it is heavily covered with snow. So sometimes the snowfall exceeds two meters at the top of the summit. And my study site was in the midfoot uh, of, the, of the island, so about 1,000 meters uh, above sea level. So it is an uh, evergreen forest, but still it is covered with sometimes, sometimes covered with snow. Uh, as you see, so I usually go to the end of a logging road by my car, but uh, when the snowfall is heavy, I couldn't go there. So I couldn't go there by, 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 by my car. So I walked to, the, to, the, to, the, to my camp for three hours or something and took a picture by myself when I was very young. Okay, but still we have a Japanese matax here. And the long-term studies of Japanese macaques have been conducted in this island in the two in two places. One is a lowland site uh, in uh, from uh, mid of 1970, and the highland study site was uh, it is in the coniferous forest, and a study a long-term study started in 2000 year of 2000. And I myself uh, started the study of this place in this forest. And I want to introduce my old study, which is derived from my PhD thesis, which is actually a core part of today's talk, today's my talk. So this is a very basic study that's describing the diet of Japanese macaques. Uh, in the highland coniferous forest of Yakushima, which is very basic, but actually which has been cited most often among my many among my studies. So their diet, uh, just summarizing in one sentence, they eat many different kinds of fruits. So they eat fruit seed, flower, mature leaves, young leaves, and other vibrant trees, and fungi and animal matters. Actually, they eat many things. Of course, they are because they are omnivorous. But if you compare the diet from other populations uh, of this species, the contrast is become more clear. So the coastal forest, lowland forest Yakushima is only seven kilometers apart from my study site in the highland. But the diet is very different. In the lowland, their main food are fruits and seed, but in the highland, the main foods are mature leaves. And it is also different from the uh, the seedless forest in northern Japan, which is Kinkazan. Here, their main food, most important foods, are seeds, which are mostly acorns or palasi uh, foods. And mature leaves are not important foods. So these, as you see, the diet of the Japanese macaques, all of them, they are omnivorous in all of the places, but their actual composition is very flexible uh, by the places. And it is also uh, flexible by seasonally. And so it, uh, the diet changes like this. 
And of course, it is correlated with the seasonal changes in the availability of fruit, uh, and seed, and flowers. Uh, I studied the seasonal fluctuations by collecting litter traps like this, and then quantify the fruit and flower litter, uh, litter fall in each month. And obviously, uh, it is very natural for temperate forests. A fruit fall increases in autumn, uh, so-called autumn, which is September, October, November. And the flower uh, availability is high is in so-called spring, which is May, uh, sorry, March, May, April, and May. And obviously, their diet, uh, seasonal change of diet, is affected by the seasonal changes of the food availability. A fruit and seed uh, availability positively affected seed consumption and fruit consumption, which is natural, of course. And when there are no many, uh, when there are fruits and seeds are not available, they switch to natural leaves, which are indicated by, by which are suggested by the negative correlation between natural leaf consumption and fruit. Uh, uh, availability. So this result means macaques eat fruits and seeds whenever they are available. And when they, these foods are not available, they eat mature leaf. So as a total annual diet composition, so mature leaves are most important foods. However, mature leaves are not necessarily the preferred foods for the Japanese macaques in this forest. Their preferred foods are fruits and seeds, which are not necessarily occupy the high proportion of their annual diet. OK, so I point out the two characteristics of the diet of Japanese macaques. One is that they can survive by depending largely on fiber-rich foods, which have not been uh, obvious by the previous studies, uh, like this and like this. So. But my, I found that mature leaves can be a very uh, significant proportion of the diet. And in long seasons, for a long period of year, this is the very major food uh, for Japanese macaques. And this is a, this must be an indispensable adaptation to live in temperate regions where fruit production is very low and seasonal fluctuations in fruit availability is very, very intense. In these situations, they in sometimes they experience a season when there are no fruits available. And second point is that even though fruits and seeds are not necessarily the constitutes a high proportion of the annual diet, but still they prefer these uh, fruits and seeds high quality in terms of energy content, high quality foods. So these foods enable them to survive the lean period by way of bad position. So in this uh, fruit abundance season, they eat a lot of fruits and seeds. And they can store those fruits and seed foods as a, as a way of fat in their own body. So those uh, foods which are consumed, foods and seeds consumed during the autumn period can be consumed by during winter when there are no such foods are available. So I think I, I thought this is feasible in temperate regions where the seasonality is predictable. So as I have shown uh, first uh, by showing the Google search image, so spring always comes in sometime in April or something, and autumn always comes. So the seasonal changes is predictable. So it is possible for them to uh, rely on those foods which have already been, already been uh, stored in their own body, because the timing which the food conditions is improved is really predictable in this habitat. So I concluded the persistence to low quality foods and preference to high quality foods are, uh, which are combined uh, with a fat deposition. These two characteristics are 
important in temperate forest. I this is my hypothesis at the time. So you can notice that uh, I pointed out two uh, characteristics of the temperate forest. However, I found that uh, there is no such literature which quantify which uh, which quantitatively proved my these these two my uh, how to say predictions or assumptions. So uh, I searched literature and. As you can easily imagine, so this is a fruit in phenology in Yakushima, which is well beautifully fitted with a cosine curve of 12 months period. And this is the fruit in phenology in Borneo, which does not have such kind of 12 month seasonality, uh, periodicity. So I collected these kind of data from all over the habitats or even the known habitats of primates and I try to find the general pattern of the difference of the temperate and tropical forest by the literature survey. So one of the first findings is the fruitful. So this is the absolute amount of fruit availability which can be combined uh, over a very global scale. So this includes many in non-primate habitats. But anyway, and there's you can see that there are huge variations e even within the same altitude zones. But anyway, eh, on average, fruitfall in tropical forests is larger than in temperate forests. It is about, but it is uh, less than two times, uh, 1.7 times or so. And of course, you can see there are huge overlap. Uh, by the way, my study site Yakushima is uh, these one, two, three, four, five. These five are Yakushima, forest in Yakushima. And this is the lowland Yakushima, and these are going to the higher. So the lowland Yakushima is fruit availability is higher than most of the tropical forest. And about the seasonality, a seasonal pattern of fruiting, there has already been a study by uh, the, these authors. And the length of the fruiting season has a peak around the equator, and it becomes shorter and shorter uh, going if you go uh, away from the equator. So, for example, in the southern Japan, uh, around here, uh, it is uh, the length of the fruiting season is about 20 or 30 percent shorter than in a tropical forest. And the timing, the most, and the timing is also different by the tropical and temperate forest. So this is a uh, uh, x-axis is a calendar month starting from January to January to then January, and the y-axis is the last year. So. For example, in this forest, the latitude is also around the equator, and the peak of the fruiting is somewhere in the June. So, if you just plot, this is just does not how to say. You may not find a pattern, but anyway, if you concentrate only around the equator in temp in tropical forests, the peaks can be found in many months. But in temperate forests, in northern temperate forests, the peaks are found only from September to December. So peaks in uh, northern hemisphere temperate forests are always found in so-called autumn season. And it is also true in the southern hemisphere. So the, uh, in southern hemisphere, the fruiting peak occurs only in austral autumn, which is February to May. So it means, so if you are, a, if you live in a tropical forest, it is very difficult to predict when is a fruiting peak occurs. Uh, it is different from, for example, India, Bangladesh, Malaysia, or Indonesia, or even within the same country, the, the, the fruiting peak may occur in very different times of year in tropical forests. But in the temperate forest, even if it is in Morocco, or Portugal, or France, or Japan, or China, 
the timing for the floating peak is really predictable. And I also uh, examine the annual uh, degree of annual periodicity in floating. So this is uh, indexed by uh, 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 this is how I uh, index this uh, annual periodicity. So annually, annually periodic means that uh, 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 changes of fruit availability in one year correlates with that of the second year. So it means the correlation with the cosine curve is high. So I regress the fruiting uh, change, uh, changes of fruit seasonality for multiple years in each site with a cosine curve. And then I calculate the R square value, how much of the variation is expressed by the annual period, annual period listing. And if the annual period is, so fruiting pattern in the first year and the second is very different, annual correlation the cosine curve is very low. Okay. So, and then, uh, obviously, so if you go away, from the equator, if you are near, if you are in the temperate forest, annual periodicity in fruiting is high than in uh, tropical forest. So the fruiting pattern in the first year, the the pat fruiting pattern you observed in the first year, is all likely to happen in the second year, as long as you index the fruiting intensity by the number of species. Okay, I did the same thing for the flushing uh, seasonality. And the flushing season in temperate forest occurs in particular months uh, in he here, like this. So this is uh, the y-axis means the day of uh, flushing peak, the January 1st the 1st and December 31st the 360. So it's a day of somewhere 150 is somewhere around May uh, or June. So, above 20 degree in northern hemisphere up 20, 20 degree or more or, or north of the northern hemisphere the fl flushing peak occurs in in spring april moon april may june or somewhere but in tropical forests it is very variable it can occur in many in many uh, di different months and the length of the flushing season is also short uh, in temperate forest than in tropical forest. Uh, here, the y-axis is a uh, is a little bit difficult, so I <laughs> is a little bit difficult to explain. But anyway, I calculated the circular uh, statistics and the to have a similar value of the number of days. Please multiply this value by two. So it means so. Around these uh, temperate forests, the y, y axis is uh, 20 something. It means the length of the flushing season is 40 or 50 days. So, anyway, obviously, so temperate forest uh, flushing season is very short compared to the temperate forest. And the timing is very predictable over space sign tropical forest. Okay, so this is same. Okay, I could summarize by the literature survey. I find I could confirm the characteristics of the temperate forest compared with the tropics, which is consistent with my with my assumption when I did as a PhD student. So fruit biomass was smaller. This is an index of absolute fruit availability. Fruit biomass is smaller in temperate forest uh, than in tropical forest, but with but the range is highly overlapped with these uh, two regions. And seasonality is larger in tropical for uh, in temperate forests than in tropical forests. Both it is true both for fruits and young leaf availability. So fruits and young leaves available only during a shorter period in one year. However, so these short fruit and flower, uh, short fruit and uh, young leaf availability is quite predictable both over space, uh, which which means that 
it occurs, protein and flushing peaks occurs very similar months in different regions of the temperate, uh, temperate uh, forest. And it is also predictable uh, by year. So the pattern you find in the first year is very likely to be to, to occur in the second year. Okay. So I assume, so this is uh, correspond with the assumption that I have made for PhD. Uh, with my with my old studies. Okay, so let's go to the, the to the other extreme, which is core part of Southeast Asia in Borneo. So my study site uh, Asoka is a uh, Maya. So these are my study subjects. Now basically, I describe the. I explain my study on the describing the diet of the red leaf monkeys, Presbytes rubitunda. So at first, I like to introduce the very unique characteristics of Southeast Asia uh, reproductive uh, reproductive pattern of the trees. So which is called general flowering and mass fruiting. So many plants come into flower for a few weeks or two few months and subsequently set fruits massively. This is called general flowering and also mass fruiting. And these species of plants rarely flower out of the, this uh, general flowering period. And this event occurs at Martia and very unpredictable intervals of two to six years. So it means animals need to survive the long lasting flower or fruit scarce period. And it is very difficult for the animals to predict how long this the fruit scarce period will last. So this is an example of the flowering and fruiting phenology and lambic hues in Sarawak and Borneo. And at the very beginning of their long-term study in 1922, they observed that the end of the fruiting, general flowering. And after that, for two, three years, they continued to observe very short, very low levels of flowering. And then in the fourth year, they observed the flowering and then subsequent fruiting. But after that, they continuously observed flowering and fruiting for three years. So you can see how unpredictable this fruiting uh, pattern is. This is what is going on in Borneo and also Sumatra. I don't explain, but uh, Sumatra and also Malay Peninsula. And my study site is such place which is a primary forest in Darren Valley Conservation in, in Eastern Sabah, which is here. Uh, by the way, so this pattern is only found in the lower and deep forests. forest. So in other type of the forest in Borneo and Sumatra, such as mountain forest or peat swamp forest, these uh, things do not necessarily happen. So please be I want to say that I want to point out this happens only in particular place of the Malay Malay Peninsula and Borneo uh, Sumatra. And this my study site is such place. And here we have a uh, five species of Diana primates in the in my study sites, which is orangutan, uh, gibbon, and two species macaques and leaf monkeys. And my main study subjects were red leaf monkeys. And during my study period, uh, for 25 months around uh, in 2007 and 2008, I was fortunate enough to observe a mass fruiting, uh, a kind of mass fruiting, uh, fruiting peak in this season. And the young, uh, so red leaf monkeys, their most important foods uh, are young leaves, uh, which has 46% of the feeding time. Uh, and the next important ones are seeds and whole fruits. So fruit and, uh, the, so the young leaves and fruit derived parts are the two most important foods for them. And among the young leaves, the only one species of liana, which is uh, Spatulus macropters, was by far the most important foods, which constituted 28% of total feeding time, and also more than half of the young leaf feeding time. Even though this is the most species-rich uh, tropical forest all over the world, 
but their survival is sustained by only one species. This is the uh, very important for Macruz for their leaf monkeys. And as I have said, the fruit derived part, fruit and seed, and also young leaves are two most important foods for these species. And their but their composition changes by seasoning. And I we I observed one fruit in peak uh, in uh, in early 2007. And at that time, fruit and seed feeding time increases. And other times, so young leaf eating is uh, young leaves are the major foods for the red leaf monkeys. And it can be confirmed by uh, my quantitative. And I, I have pointed out that the, the only one species are important as a fallback foods. So I tried to figure out how they selected among, among the many species of young leaves. I tried to figure out what is the determinant factor deciding that uh, young leaves uh, as a food for them. So at first, I compared food and non-food uh, species and conducted uh, GLM analysis, a bi as a binomial. Uh, and then I found the best fit model included only crude protein. So it means, so they decide who to eat or not by the content of the protein included in the foods. And the second analysis is, so, okay, so now they uh, include about seven species uh, of young leaves as food. And among the seven species, only the Spatrox macropteris was very important. Others were the consumption of other species, much smaller. And why is it decided, why, why they show such a biased pattern of feeding. So the answer is that they eat, just eat very abundant foods, uh, which is a macropteris, a food spatulus macropteris. So their way of uh, food selection is very simple. The first thing is that they eat, they decide to eat or not to eat by the nutritional properties. If the uh, protein content is high, so they decide to eat it. And among those uh, food species, they just eat, which, is, which they encounter very often uh, as a main food. Actually, this rule uh, is also found in the, in the case of Japanese macaques in Hainan, Yakushima. So in this forest, also, only two species are important as a mature leaf foods. That's a Simplocus militase and also Eurea japonica. So these two foods are by far the most important mature leaf foods, constituting 33 and 71, uh, 17% the total eating time. And these two species are very dominant in the forest floor. So this is, the forest is extensively covered. The undergrowth is extensively covered by these two species. And variation in heating time of food species, as explained by the, this, this abundance. Ah, so and also, I also found that the uh, nutritional properties uh, of food, food leaves is higher than non-food leaves. So the same things are uh, observed for Japanese macaques and also the red leaf monkeys. So I can point out many similarities in the response to seasonality between Japanese macaques and red leaf monkeys. So they prefer fruits and seeds, which change the, uh, the seasonality, and which change the availability in seasonality. And when these foods decreases, they switch to preferably low quality, but abundant foods, which are leaves. In case of Japanese macaques, that is mature leaves. In case of leaf monkeys, it is young leaves. And the criteria to choose this uh, fallback food is also the same for the two species. However, it, so it is superficially, the dietary response is similar, but its the seasonality is really the same within temperate and tropical forests. 
So I have already summarized the characteristic of the temperate forest compared to the uh, tropics. So this is this should be deep. So as I have pointed out, predictability low. Uh, Predictability over time is different between two regions. It is low in tropical forests. It is high in temperate forests. And actually, so the over space, the general flowering is also unpredictable over space. This is a very large scale study uh, of. Uh, mass fruity in so many places in peninsula part of Malaysia. So this is a kind of crazy study to visit these places uh, every two months or something and recorded the general flowering is, is going on or not or something, something. And anyway, I don't explain any detail, but uh, the general flowering is also unpredictable over space. You cannot know even if it is happening here, it does not mean that it is also happening here. Sometimes it is happening in many places, but sometimes not. Okay, so I have pointed out that's the characteristic of diet of Japanese macaques. So, uh, first thing is that they uh, depend largely on fiber rich foods. Uh, which is a necessary adaptation uh, because uh, uh, fruit production is very low and sometimes they experience a long period of no fruit is available. Actually, later on, I and my colleagues uh, found that pattern is found for uh, many species, not only Japanese macaques. So if you go, so this is a review of the macaques and Asian corvine monkeys. So if you go, away from the equator, the fruit feeding decreases and the leaf feeding increases. Uh, so if you live in, need to live in a temperate forest, you have to have an adaptation to feed largely on fiber-rich foods. But it is still not clear what makes this possible without any genetic changes in their own genome. Of course, it is possible the so Japanese macaques, typically temperate living primates, have a specific genes to survive in such habitat. However, how about rhesus macaques, which live in, uh, in a snowy Himalaya and also uh, some parts of the Indochina Peninsula? So their habitat is so huge. So it is difficult to assume that there is a genetic changes which can uh, make them possible to survive in temperate forests like this. So the one possible answer is a gut microbe, which I have been studying very intensely recently. A typical human individual harbors 10 to 100 trillion symbiotic microorganisms. And human gut microorganisms, microorganisms are estimated to, to possess 3.3 million non-redundant non genes. And this is so much. This is uh, 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 for me, it is a little bit difficult to count the million and thousand because uh, it is a different we we to my car. So anyway, so the difference is so, so huge. So the, the total amount of genes that we have by ourselves, by our, our gen, our own gen is so, so few compared to the genome of the gut microbe. And this can be possibly an important adaptation for generous animals which change their diet flexibly in response to fluctuations to of food availability. Of course, you need to have an evolutionary time to change your own genome, but it is it, you can do it very shortly to change the genome of the gut microbe. Actually, so there are many studies uh, indicating the flexible changes of the gut microbe by many ecological 
conditions. This is a study of a student of mine, which compare that's gut micro uh, gut microbiota species uh, community composition over many uh, populations of Japanese macaques. So these blue ones are wild populations, and green ones are uh, provisioned, and yellow ones are uh, uh, crop raiding animals. And these are captive animals. So interesting, if you go for the, the gut micro community composition changes gradually from wild ones and lightly provisioned and crop raiding and heavily provisioned and then uh, uh, captive individuals, captive populations. So, but as an ecologist, what I want to know is not these kinds of very beautiful so many complex of figures. This is not my, the, my student's paper. This is a paper of the great uh, gorillas and chimpanzees. So it is a uh, gut microbe is a community of one five hundred of or several hundred or even one thousand species of the bacteria. So you can do many kinds of complicated analysis. But as an ecologist, this is not what I want to know. What I want to know is very simple. Which gut micro, uh, which is gut micro species or gut micro biota, is better at fermentation? So fermentation of bacterial digestion. So anyway, which would be which kind of gut micro helps the host animals to survive for the digestion of the food? So what I'm interested in is uh, this in vitro fermentation assay, which is very simple way and gut microbe ecology to answer the simple question, the simple ecological question. So as I have explained, that the dietary composition is very different from the lowland, uh, from lowland and highland. So highland macaques eat leaves and lowland macaques eat a lot of foods. And we collected the fresh foods, fresh fecal samples from the uh, lowland and highland of Yakushima. Uh, we conducted these studies as a form of uh, field goals. So uh, I also invited a student from India. Well, actually, she was a Nepalese, but anyway, she was from the Indian Institute of Science. So and we collected the fresh peas and mixed with the leaf powders and incubated for 24 hours on an anaerobic and uh, body temperature and conditions. And I we measured the uh, uh, gas production by inserting syringe like this, uh, gas, gas production by the bacteria. And gas production during fermentation is higher, consistently higher for the highland species than the lowland species. So, and also short chain fatty acid, which is a product of the bacteria fermentation. So, the host animals, including the macaques and humans, cannot utilize the cellless by our own genome, but we can utilize the uh, cellulose derived short chain fatty acids. So, a butyric acid uh, production was higher in the lower than in the, uh, was higher in the higher than in the lower. So, gut microbe in the higher in uh, macaques, whose major foods are leaves, are more able to ferment it, leaves than in the lower run, where fruits and seeds are major foods. So this study, my my study, this study provides a very simple evidence that gut, gut microbe can contribute to the digestion of the host who has a flexible diet. In this case, in this case, highland specific leaf dominated foods. Okay, so the about the first characteristic I have pointed out. So gut microbe can be one solution. Of course, we need to, I, I want to know more follow-up studies to come out. And second thing is uh, a preference of high quality foods, such as fruits and seeds, which would be an indispensable adaptation, where, which is if combined with a fat deposition. A fat accumulation has been reported among many uh, temperate primates, such as Japanese macaques, uh, Tibetan macaques, and many other endosome animals, such as bear or uh, wild boars or, or more. But I think not often studied in 
I think there have been no study for temperate colobites, such as snub-nosed monkeys. And also, there's no study for Himalayan lungs. However, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that uh, tropical primates do not accumulate fat, because there's an already well-known exception, which is not orangutan. So orangutans also are known to accumulate and, and metabolize fat. Uh, so this is a study uh, of uh, orangutans in central Kalimantan by Sheryl Knott. Uh, she observed one fruiting peak uh, sometime in, in the earlier part of the fruiting peak uh, in her study period. And in these study periods, their diet composition was mostly fruits like this. And when the fruits uh, become scarce, they switch the diet to these kinds of foods, bark or leaves. Well, this, these photos are from my own study site. But anyway, and these fruits scarce period, so she detected uh, ketones, which is as which uh, indicates that uh, metabol metabolization of the fat, which is already in the own body. So when their fruit food availability decreases, and they need to de switch the low quality diet, they spend the fat which have already been deposited in their own body. So that is uh, one of the ways to survive the fruit scarce period. So, so they do the same thing as the Japanese macaques. And the difference of fruit uh, energy intake is so intense. So she calculated the energy intake by around us uh, by mass fruiting and non mass fruiting period. And the difference reaches as large as four times which is so large. Actually, but actually, so uh, I have visited her laboratory in February 2013, and the files of her original data have been so beautifully kept in her laboratory, starting from 2022, I think, and up to, well, around here it was, I don't know, 1922 up to 2011 or 12. I think it is still going on. But I forgot <laughs> to ask her what happens? What happens after she left her study site? So the forest is, sorry, the forest is not like the Japanese forest. So, the forest is not a Japanese forest. In Japan, we can expect that if you survive the winter, spring always come, right? So what's going on there is predictable. But in Borneo, it's not like this. If you once experience the fruiting, and then there's no way for you to know which the, when the next one comes. So it may be okay to consume the fat which have been deposited by this time. But for these animals, I don't know what they do. So this is a very long lasting question for me since I first read her paper, but I forgot to ask her the answer when I visit there. So anyway, so as a future directions, I'd like to point out if unpredictability is essence, is an essential characteristic of tropical forest, how do primates cope with it? And in particular for orangutans, after consuming the fat, how the orangutans survive the long lasting uh, non fruiting period, which will last unpredictable period of time. Actually, orangutans are very interesting, amazing animals, which can... Uh, this is my most recent study, which compares the abundance patterns, uh, seasonal abundance patterns during my study period of 25 months. And as, as I have explained, I observed one fruiting peak. So this is a, a line, uh, sorry, a bar chart. Bar chart is a fruiting pattern. 
bar chart is a floating pattern. So it's the same for these six videos. And the line chart is the changes of the abundance for these uh, species of primates. Uh, the orangutans are indexed by orangutan themselves and also orangutan nest. And you can see orangutans and also orangutan nest increases their number at the time of fruiting. Of course, it is impossible for them to give birth a lot of baby and then die. So it, it, it never happens. So it means they immigrated into my study site from somewhere else. But for other species, gibbons and leaf monkeys, macaques, those kinds of uh, influxes are not observed. And interestingly, I uh, we conducted the, this kind of monitoring at the two places in my study site, in, in two places of study sites, which are 10 kilometers apart, which is in the same conservation area, but still it is 10 kilometers away. And interestingly, these influxes were observed simultaneously in the two study sites. So their movement of the rounders are very likely to be larger than 10 kilos or more. We never know how they can predict such kind of things are going on in the neighboring forest they live in. So around us are very special, but actually the other species are not necessary. So, so this is a pattern of the ranging pattern of the red reef monkeys uh, uh, seasonal pattern. And uh, both of the home range and also daily uh, past length does not change by the diet. And the place they use uh, is also the same. They remain the same place before the mass fruiting and during the mass fruiting and after mass fruiting. So they do not respond. They they change the diet, but they do not respond. Uh, they do not modify their ranging patterns. So the, I think there are many many, many cases. Orangutans are probably very special, but there have been many varieties among the species. So, And also, I'm very interested, what is going on? I introduced the very two extremes in Japan and Borneo, but there are so many in the middle between the two extremes. So, for example, southern China, Indochina, and also India. So India is very interesting, so because it also has a altitude and variation uh, from a uh, very high part of the Himalaya. And also goes to the very southern tip of the Indian continent, subcontinent, which is very, must be very hot. I have never been there. And also, uh, I uh, pointed out the uniqueness of the mass fruit in Southeast Asia. But I think actually it is, we have to quantify how unique, we have to quantify the uniqueness of Southeast Asia by other, by the fruit in phenology of other tropics, African or American tropics. So these are the future directions, which future things we need to do. Okay, so today's my talk started from very simple question of my old studies, of my old study, which is which is a very simple study, a very basic ecology of Japanese macaques. But anyway, it expanded in many in many different directions from the difference of a tropical temperate forest and a gut microbe and how we can connect to the how we can understand compare the diet of red leaf monkeys or even around them. So uh, I so this I don't know how old you are, so the the audience of this talk, but uh, these very core, very basic studies can go beyond, can develop into many ways. So that is a very that is a fun as a scientist to I, I mean to, to continue as a time scientist. So I had such question when I was young as this. Uh, and then the very infant, young infant, which was born at the time when I initiated my long study, is now very full grown, and she has uh, three infants or maybe grand, grand offspring. So, and I also have 
become old. But uh, I also, uh, I hope you also can have a very interesting uh, questions by yourself and uh, which can be pursued for decades or more. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Dr. Anya. Thank you very much for the <clears throat> enlightening talk. Uh, I'm sure people here will uh, um, take some pointers from your talk and do some interesting research. So uh, there are a few questions that uh, I'll ask now. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first question is by yeah, Juan. So he says, uh -huh. uh, under what conditions uh, do they eat animals? As in, okay. I think mm -hmm. what he meant is that, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, there is availability of rich fiber food. Still, they consume animals. Why? Okay, okay. Yeah. So they eat, the animals they eat is uh, first insects and other arthropods, such as centipedes or spiders. But they also eat the frogs and lizards, which is very okay, <coughs> uh, infrequently. So actually, so they are not all foods. They like to eat whenever it is available. But uh, Japanese macaques are not small primates, so they are not tamarins or they are not guenons. So their those of insect foods are usually not abundant enough in the habitat to satisfy their nutritional amount. So they eat whenever they are available, but I think it is it is not a major food. So they say so when they prefer rich species. Uh -huh. Yeah. So they eat when they are available. And this is a temperate forest. So those uh, animals are very active in summer, but you, you never can, you never find them in winter. So it is the, I think animal consumption is strongly uh, correlated with ambient temperature, not the availability of other foods. Yeah. yeah. So, um... The next question is by Ram. It says, what do you think explains the unpredictability of flowering and fruiting in Southeast Asian tropical forests? And do you expect this pattern to be observed in other tropical forests as well? <laughs> so this is a very, I'm not a plant ecologist. So uh, all, what I, all I, what I can tell you is very text, textbook like explanations. And actually there are so many, so many people working there. But one possible, <laughs> Uh, ultimate explanation is that uh, uh, predator satiation, high pastures. So if you make a flower, huge amount of flower or seeds at one time, uh, which is a beyond of the ability of the seed predator to consume at one time. So they need to, they need to have some time lag to increase their number, right? So if suddenly so many amount of seed are available, so the seed predator cannot respond by increasing their number. So many seeds can survive. They can escape the predation of the, of the seed predator. That is expected uh, ultimate causes of the uh, mass fruiting. Of course, the, the question should be applied to other, other forests. So any Japanese and North American and uh, African Indian forests, all those forests have a uh, seed predators. So it is only one side of the explanation. Mm. And why only in Southeast Asia? It is <laughs> one, one thing is uh, the, it is dominated by diptocarp, diptocarp, one family of species, one family of trees. So it is uh, driven by those by very major uh, uh, tree family in the forest. And that is uh, not very rare in African forests and not found in American forests. So that may be one think, yeah. Yeah, I think same is the case in India, right? Then, no dipterocarps in Indian, uh, except for Northeast India. So the pattern there is also going to be different, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, 
So next questions. There are two questions again by Ram. First is we have worked on almost all major groups of primates. Um, uh, given their different natural histories, did you find it difficult to compare? Wait, yeah, did you find it difficult to compare and contrast the findings from them? And uh, should I read the second question, or okay. you want to answer the first? Aslam, I don't think I covered almost all the major groups. I have never studied lemurs. I have never studied Tarsius. <laughs> yeah. I have never studied the neotropical primates. So I have studied only minor, and <laughs> not minor, but some, some of the. But anyway, I, I feel that's a rule of the rule of the. Well, I'm a field ecologist. So in terms, in terms of the area of field ecology, their rule is quite straightforward. It's similar among the, well, at least uh, sarcopithecines, corobite monkeys, mm -hmm. and gray apes, uh, and also less apes. So if so you I study, the, yeah, if you study insect eating animals, it's very different, so. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, his uh, question was among uh, Asian primates. So like you have studied major groups of uh, Asian primates, mm -hmm. and uh, that's what he meant, not like primates mm -hmm. across the globe. Mm, but, but yeah, I guess you have answered it. Well, there are, of course, there are many practical difficulties. Yeah. <laughs> In Japanese, my <laughs> home range. My, the sub home range is 2.4 kilometers square. You need a rugged terrain like this. I studied observing like this. But home range of the red leaf monkeys was only 16 hectares, 16 hectares, 400 meter, 400 meter, very flat terrain. It was so easy. Oh. So I, if I, I thought I was afraid if I go too accustomed to the Borneo situations, I cannot go back to Japan. <laughs> and my colleagues studying the I have been to Africa Africa study sites to collect the feces of gorillas and chimpanzees. But their the, my colleagues studying gorillas, their home range, well they, their home range, I mean the primatologist's home range is exceeds fifty square kilometers. So huge. So of course there are many practical differences. Yeah. As, lo as long as we, we have the data of the feeding, the, the data of the diet. I think it's a, I don't have many differences. I don't feel many differences among the among the among the uh, tax different tax. Okay. okay. So uh, the second question by Ram, the second part of the question is that what do you think uh, would be the best okay. questions that Indian primatologists can ask with respect to you know your area of work uh, in the context of Indian primates to better our understanding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the, the 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 advantage of Indian primatology is that the diversity of the habitat from very north to the very high altitude Himalaya and uh, very hot the very hot southern uh, southern India. So I think that is the advantage. So so many different species. Uh, live in very different habitat. Of course, so, so there are many other primate rich habitats such as Indonesia or Democratic Republic of Congo. But even those countries, so the diversity of the habitat is higher for India, I think, and also the China, anyway. Mm. So I think that could be our uh, advantage from the perspective of the feeding courses, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, having so many habitats in one country is, of course, I also feel that e I feel very easy to do a field work in my own country, but I have difficulty. I, I, it's possible for me to go, to go out, of, out of Japan to study there, but I still have very difficulty uh, to study abroad. So study, it is a very great advantage to study in, our, in your own country. So, yes. Okay. So um, I guess, I think there are no more questions now. Mm -hmm. So um, I would like to thank Dr. Hanya 
for this wonderful talk and thanks to all the viewers on facebook and youtube and also people who joined us on streamyard uh, thank you everyone thank you and um, yeah uh, and yeah i'll just uh, make a quick announcement about our next talk so our next speaker is professor matsuzawa from again from primate research institute kyoto university japan uh, he's going to talk about his uh, interesting work on chimpanzee intelligence uh, and he's going to contrast uh, the work he did in the lab as well as in the wild so everyone please stay tuned to our various social media platform handles uh, we'll update the details soon so dr hania would like to say the some last uh, ending words <laughs> Not anymore. So I'm going to field work from tomorrow, uh, from next week. So unfortunately, I can go to my study site at the time of the pandemic. So good luck <laughs> with you too. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Very okay. Much.